when I went to seminary, I did something somewhat rash. I had to move all of my books, and I had like three or four tall bookshelves of science fiction and fantasy, and so I gave away about two-thirds of it. And, and you know what happens when you give away that much all at once? You look back and you say, darn it. Right? The, the, one of the books I really wish I had not given away was a book called uh, Changeling. And uh, I want to tell you about this book because it has stayed for me now for over 20 years. And it, came, it, it became important to me again as I was preparing for this sermon. It's the story it's set in a, in a dystopic, depressing future in which corporations control everything, nations have faded, technology has become very advanced, but everything is very gritty. Right, hard. It, who here has seen the movie Blade Runner? The early Harrison Ford. Yeah, think Blade Runner. Right, that, that, that's kind of what this future is set in. And uh, at some point between now and then, three centuries or so down the line, a change has happened, and uh, it's unexplained. No one can exp understand what's going on. But about a fifth of people, when they hit their teenage years would become changelings, as they were called. They would go through a, a mutation, and, and some of them would end up being seven, eight foot tall, heavily muscular, and they, they were called orcs, or ogres. And uh, some of them would just stop growing altogether and have, end up with pointy ears because it's science fiction. You gotta have pointy ears somewhere, right? <laughs> so, and they were called elves, right? Elves. And so this is this, this future in which this book is set, and, and it revolves around a father and a son, and all, there's no other family, it's the father and the son. And the father works for this major corporation, he's a scientist doing research, and when it gets to the point where the son is of the age where this change might happen, one-fifth, right? You don't know who's going to get it, it happens to him. And so he starts to grow, and he ends up to be this seven-foot-tall ogre. And just imagine for a minute a 14-year-old teen with all the anger issues that go with being 14, all of a sudden you're seven-foot-tall, three-foot-taller than your dad, and about three times stronger. I mean, so it's kind of a, it's a hard family situation. And so the family, the father and the son, they struggle with this. And the father just can't get over it. The sense of shame because his son is one of them, right? The son leaves. He, he isn't accepted by his father, so the son leaves. And a goodly chunk of the rest of the book is how the son makes his way in this future and figures out how he shall live and who can he trust, who he can't trust, what, he, what he's going to do, life on the streets. And, and so it, it was very intriguing, at least to 16-year-old Andy. Um, the climax of the book comes when we follow the son who has started to do the research of his father. He wants to still be like his dad. He's, he's doing the research of his father, and he's been researching the, the genetics of why do people change? What's, what's the mutate, what drives this mutation? How can you predict it? Why does it happen? Can it be reversed? And he cracks it, right? He understands. He understands how you can tell who's going to change and how to reverse it. And so he sneaks in to his father's lab in this major lockdown corporation setup. And he finds his father's research. And what he finds is that his father has been doing the same research for decades. The father has wanted to have his son back how he was. And so this, the father ha, ha, is almost there. He's about to figure out how to tell who's going to have this mutation and, and how to reverse it. And the son is looking at his father's work. In this sense, I mean, in it, and it's not just about the science at this point, right? It's about the father who can't accept the son unless the son is normal, right? And, and the son's need to be accepted. And the son, like, looks back on his life and now how he has learned and all that he has understood in his friendship and his community. And he has to decide what to do. Because the son has the answer. And, and so he understands how to understand it and how to reverse it. He has to decide either to leave this work for his father, to complete his father's work, or something else. And what he does is he ends up sabotaging his father's work because he comes to the conclusion that who he is is not the problem, right? That he is a seven foot tall, muscular fellow, that's not something that needs to be cured. That's just who he is, right? The book never explicitly states it. And that's probably what makes it good writing and why it has stayed with me so long. But it's, what it's grappling with is this question about are there problems that technology cannot fix? 
There is no gene therapy that will cure a father who will not accept his son. That, that's at the end of the story, you walk away, and then that's what it is, right? There is no cure, there is no gene therapy, there is no technology that will cure a father who does not accept his son. I was thinking about this as we were thinking about another technology we have. What's one of the most impressive pieces of technology in this room? Right? Here it is. It's a smartphone. What can't you do with a smartphone? Record audio, video, compose music, make movies, do all your finances, submit your taxes. There's an app for that, right? What can't you do with this? Email, write books, hook up a keyboard. You can run your life off of one of these. What do we do with it most? What's that? Actually, no. The thing we do on smartphones, we don't, we don't talk on smartphones most. The thing we... Facebook. Facebook. Think about it. What of, of all your laptop, your smartphone, of all the technology you have, the thing we do most is get on Facebook, isn't it? Let's talk about Facebook for just a second. We live in one of the loneliest times that has ever been. Britain did a study on men and men and friendships, and they found that half of the men that they did in this big, large study of the whole population, half of the men did not have two friends they could lean on, or they could turn to, or they could trust. 11% of the single men and 15% of the married men did not have a single friend they could turn to if they had a problem or they had to talk to someone or they needed someone to trust. Right, you think about how often people move today and, and how often both parts, a husband and a wife, both have to work and how that's impacting our social, uh, the social structures, the elks, the lions, the scouts, the churches. The organizations that bring people together to nurture and develop friendships are really struggling. We live in a very lonely time. And so it's not a surprise that we have Facebook, because what do we have on Facebook? We have Facebook friends. But a Facebook friend, it, is a Facebook friend really a friend? What, what does it mean to be a Facebook friend? There's nothing that I could click or tap or swipe on this that can create the friendship that I need. True, right? Nothing I can tap that can create the friendship that we need. We're reading uh, about, we're obviously talking about technology today. We've talked about a, a technology that does not exist. We've talked about technology that we have today. And I want to talk about an ancient technology. Cutting edge for its time, but a technology we hear about in Genesis. Did you catch what that technology was? What was the technology we read about in Genesis 11? Brick making. Excellent, yes. If you think about it, that is cutting edge technology. We're going to fire these bricks and we're going to put them together with mortar. Think about all the things you can do with that. You can build shelter for your family so that they are dry in the rain, so that they are warm in the cold. You can build storage places, silos to put your grain so that you don't have to worry about the drought. You are hungry even when you can't grow a you don't go hungry even when you can't grow a crop. You can still feed your animals. You can reinforce pits and make threshing pits. I mean, you can do so many things with brick. We still use it today. What type of building are we sitting in? It's brick, right? It looks a bit different, but it's the same technology. You fire some brick, you put it together with, the, with mortar, and this building is over 100 years old. Cutting edge technology. Of all the things that they can do with this brick, with this technology, what do they do? They say, come let us build ourselves a city and a tower that will bring us to the heavens. And whenever you read about the heavens in scripture, hear God, because the, the practice was you don't say God's name because God might be offended, so you say heaven. So let us build a tower to bring us back to God. They know that they have a problem, right? They, have a no, they know that they have a problem. The story of Genesis is a story, of the, especially these first 11 chapters, of the story of God creating something good. And sin 
that begins to break it and how God will respond. If you think about it, like Adam, Adam and Eve, they have a snack, first problem. And then from the first people, you then have Cain and Abel, the first family fight, that's the sin. And then we have uh, the, the generation that's corrupt, so we have the flood and Noah, and that's a problem. And then after the flood, it's not like we can wipe the, the land clean. You have uh, Noah and his son Shem, who finds his... Uh, father drunk and doesn't cover him back up. I mean, so the, the sin, the impact of sin on the people is definitely there. And the people here, they realize that sin has made them distant from God. Because that's what sin does, right? If I go up and I sin against you, if I come up and punch you right now, are you going to get close to me next time I come walking up? Right? So sin makes us distant from each other, and they want to be connected to God again. They're trying to get back to the God they miss. But there is no brick that will build the relationship to God that we need. There is no brick that can build a, if you'll forgive the phrase, a stairway to heaven. The challenge of technology, whether it is something cutting edge of the future, whether it's something we have today or something in the distant past, the challenge of technology is knowing what it can do and what it cannot do. There is no technology that can make a father accept a son there's no technology that can create friendship. And there's no technology that can build a relationship with our Lord. And when we try, when we try to use technology for that which we ought not, it goes badly, doesn't it? We know this because we've been on Facebook, haven't we? Right? This week, a friend of mine asked for advice about how to be healthier. She asked. She, she already runs marathons. She is healthy, right? She's doing just fine. She wants to be healthier. She asked, what type of sweetener should I use? So I, I have an opinion about this. You may remember, I have a degree in biology. I've talked to an organic chemist about this. I'm intrigued by the function of the gut to absorb chemicals, protein channels. Like, I know just a little bit about this. I have an opinion. And so I offered an opinion. Honey, honey is an excellent sweetener. But if you have to have something in a packet, I choose yellow, right? And I could tell you why I choose the yellow, but your eyes would glaze over. So just believe me, I think it's, it's, it's fairly healthy. I think you're safe, right? I said this. And Facebook, which is full of friends, right? A lady who I've never met before starts telling me that I am wrong and misinformed and that I better change my ways, and I get... I get on the receiving end of something that was just not very friendly. Over sweetener. <laughs> when we push technology to do what it is not meant to do, we end up just as confused and messed up and at odds as the people trying to make the Tower of Babel. And while it's amusing to talk about it when it comes to Facebook, there are other places where we push technology too far and the implications get very, very serious. For example, in the field of medicine, there is always a new treatment drug scan. I mean, oh, there's always something new going on. There's always a new technology. How many of you have known someone on an, on an experimental treatment for cancer? Yeah, right? There's always something new to try. We are always looking for one more option, one more treatment, one more opinion, and there is a time and a place for that. But just like there is no website that can create friendship, there is no pill that can defeat death. There is no pill. It, does, it doesn't, isn't made. Technology is great for what it is great at, but there is much that it cannot do, and it turns out it cannot do what is most important. Technology cannot give us a family that accepts us, friends that walk with us, a Lord who saves us, or a path through death. Technology cannot give us shortcuts to any of these. The only way to have them is in relationship to each other and in relationship to our Lord. Or as Jesus put it, the most important things in life, love the Lord your God and love your neighbor. Technology can't do it for you. It just doesn't work. It is my prayer that we may learn the lesson of Babel. And that we use technology for all that it can do, and it can do much. And then, when it is time, we put it down. And then we focus on only what we can do, in relationship to each other, and in relationship to our Lord. Amen.
come to a time when we confess 